Hi. Um, I'm going to try doing these from my uh, from my desk from now on. Uh, one of one a, a comment I had gotten recently um, asked uh, if I could send the uh, the reading uh, schedule each week uh, because some of y'all have had a hard time accessing the uh, Google Sheets document that the reading schedule is on. So I will try to do that from here on in. Um, and, uh, if I don't send me an email to remind me, um, today we are, um, accelerating our pace a little bit. Um, we're going to try to get all the way through the patriarchs and, um, the, uh, the first couple of chapters of the Exodus today, um, trying to get caught back up. Uh, there are still some questions I received at the beginning of the course that I have not addressed yet, and I will try to send out an email addressing some of those questions individually, um, or I will respond to them in the way that I received them. Um, it's not that those questions aren't important, it's uh, that we're trying to get to the uh, overarching narrative in the Old Testament, um, and so I'm having to cut through uh, some of some of my earlier plans as I realize how much time all of this takes up. Um, today, uh, we're going to start with just a quick discussion on the patriarchs. Um, the patriarchs are the uh, uh, heads of household, the fathers of the uh, nation of Israel. Um, the latter half of Genesis, uh, more than half, the latter two-thirds, uh, three-fourths of Gen Genesis are the um, the stories of the patriarchs being in chapter 12. Well, actually, the end of chapter 11 when it mentions Terah, uh, the father of Abraham. Um, so Terah has three sons that are named. Um, Abraham, Haran, whose son Lot is uh, the one who will continue on with Abraham into the promised land, and then Nahor. Um, and uh, Nahor kind of uh, goes out of the story for a little bit. Um, and comes back in a little later. Uh, his descendants come back in a little later as Abraham is finding a wife for Isaac. Um, the sons of Terah um, and, excuse me, Terah takes his sons and they move out of, um, well, actually, we will get to that later. So uh, in front of you is a, a chart, um, a very rough chart sort of depicting some of the family relationships between uh, the Israelites and some of the surrounding nations. So the big ones, you'll notice on here, uh, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, um, and Arabs, um, and Edom, Moab, and Ammon are all very close relation, relatives, according to um, the Hebrew scripture of the uh, Israelite people. Um, also, uh, uh, I have Ishmaelites, uh, dash Arab on, on there. Um, the Arabs also, other Arab, tr Arabic tribes are the descendants of, uh, Keturah, the concubine or latter wife of Abram after, uh, Abraham after Sarah dies. Um, <clears throat> so this chart, uh, you can, uh, I will try to send out the slides. Um, if you are reading through um, the Old Testament, sometimes it can be helpful in understanding why the Israelites are friendlier with these people or have a bigger beef with these people. It can be helpful to understand how they view themselves as re relatives to those people. Um, and in fact, by the time we get to the Exodus, um, you'll start reading and you'll notice that the Hebrews are continually interacting with these people who are not the Canaanites. They are other descendants of Terah or Abraham. Um, so uh, it's, it's some interesting politics going on there. Uh, the next page here, uh, we have Jacob and just a graph uh, briefly detailing um, all of the messed up stuff that goes into uh, Jacob's family. Um, you'll see that, uh, um, some of, some of the, uh, politics, again, as you read through Israel's history, it can be helpful to understand some of the politics that are going on, um, if you want to go back to look and see, 
uh, which tribes are most closely related, uh, which tribes had the same mother. Um, Joseph uh, gets split into two and technically three tribes, um, Manasseh and Ephraim, and then Manasseh's descendants go on to inhabit two separate parts of the Promised Land, uh, East Manasseh and West Manasseh, uh, one on one, one half of the Jordan and one on the other. Um, <clears throat> but uh, one interesting note, which I don't think I get to later. Um, well, we'll get to it later. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> keep moving. Um, some major events that happened under Terra is he removes his family from Ur in what would be what, what would have at that time been the kingdom of Sumer um, in the region that would become Babylon. Um, it is important to note, and I think we talked about this when we looked at the Table of Nations earlier in Genesis, um, the, uh, the Hebrews don't consider themselves that far removed um, biologically from the uh, Babylonians and the Akkadians, or uh, Assyrians. Um, and uh, Abraham is... Um, Abraham's family, Terah's family, comes from that part of the world, southern Mesopotamia, and they travel up through Akkadia. Uh, the Akkadians and the Sumerians have r routine conflicts with each other. Uh, one will conquer the other and instill a, a foreign elite, and then that foreign elite will get shrugged off, and the retaliation will result in the uh, previously conquering nation being the conquered and having a foreign elite established over them. And this back and forth goes on and on and on until some other groups move into the area and subjugate both of them. Um, and so some possibilities for Abraham and his family are that they are either some of the um, military elite from Sumar um, and after another Akkadian incursion, they are removed from Sumer uh, to limit their power. Um, or they are Akkadian elites, and because of a Sumerian uprising, they have to flee, and they go to the more stable uh, Akkadian outcroppings in, uh, in northern, um, northern Canaan. Um, Terra and uh, Nahor... Um, only make it as far as Haran, and uh, that is uh, north of Canaan, some way still um, up up in the mountains, um, close to the source of uh, Euphrates. And then uh, Abraham, or excuse me, then Abram uh, and Lot continue down south and uh, make it into the Promised Land. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, oh, and that's all on the next slide. Um, so, yeah, Abraham moves his family into southern Canaan um, after God calls him to do so. And God makes the first recorded covenant since Noah um, with Abraham. And this is important because um, with Adam, we have a representative of the whole human race. With Noah, we have a single family that represents the whole human race. And now the story is narrowing in, and we are getting to a single family that will become a nation, but the story has narrowed into a single family. And God um, is making a uh, covenant rather than with the whole of humanity or the whole of creation like he did with Adam and Noah, he makes it with a man, Abraham. <laughs> Um, and uh, Abraham's family. And he says, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Um, but the blessing is Abraham's, um, and he's given it so that he will be a blessing. Um, so Abraham's, uh, he uh, has many misadventures. Uh, uh, multiple times he calls his wife his sister, implicit implicitly offering her up for sex in exchange for his safety. Um, and uh, he uh, gets really involved in some of the local politics. He defends some Canaanites from invaders who also came from uh, either Acadia or Sumer, uh, depending on how you interpret certain things. Um, he, uh, he goes down and pulls an atom, and he listens to his wife instead of God, um, and uh, he has a son, uh, Ishmael, 
um, by a concubine because Sarah did not believe God and he allowed Sarah to convince him to not believe God. Uh, instead of him being the one who heard from God instructing her, she is letting fear instruct her and instructing her husband out of that fear. Um, so um, that, that cycle has repeated itself from Adam to Abraham. Um, but God doesn't give up on Abraham either. Uh, he keeps going and he reaffirms the covenant um, and gives him the covenant of circumcision as a sign that God hasn't give up, given up on him. Um, and uh, <laughs> after that happens, uh, there's this interesting little incident. Um, Lot at this time has moved on to uh, live in Sodom or uh, Gomorrah, one of the two. Um, and... Uh, so Abraham has a vested interest in, in the uh, well-being of these cities. And after God meets with Abraham and reaffirms the covenant, um, he says to himself, God says to himself, if I'm really going to treat Abraham as my covenant partner, can I really keep this from him? And he decides that that's not okay. So he turns to Abraham and says, this is what I'm planning on doing. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, they, they're worship practices and their uh, their evil has come up to me and I have heard um, essentially uh, echoing our attention back to God hearing the uh, the innocent blood crying out from the ground um, God is saying he's heard uh, he, the the evils of um, Sodom and Gomorrah have um, lifted up to him and so he's going to destroy them and Abraham prays on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah and says, are you really going to kill them all, even if there are, you know, 50? Um, I think he starts with 50. 50 honest men. It's 50 decent men in Sodom. Um, would you destroy the whole uh, of Sodom even for those 50 men? And God says, no, if there are 50, I will spare the whole, the whole city. And so Abraham gets a little more bold, and he goes back and he says, well, wait, I'm... What about 10? If there was one missing from the 50, would you, would you, if there, if there were five missing from the 50, would you destroy the whole city on account of those five? God says, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't destroy the city on account of 45 uh, righteous men. And this back and forth goes on and the boldest he gets, I think, is 10 men. Uh, this would be in chapter 13, uh, no, not 13, chapter 19, I think, of Genesis. Um, no, chapter 18 of Genesis. And he gets down, um, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once more. Suppose ten are found there, and he said, I will not destroy it on account of ten. And as soon as he finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. And this back and forth leads us to believe that if Abraham had just been a little more bold, um, he could have asked God, would you spare it on behalf of the one? Um, and if God uh, found Lot to be a righteous man, then the whole of Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared on behalf of Lot because of the prayers of Abraham. But uh, Abraham was not so bold and Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, um, and uh, presumably because there were roving bands of rapists, um, though there are some traditions who suggest that uh, the big problem is who the roving bands of rapists want to have sex with and not the fact that there are roving bands of rapists, which is confusing to me. Um, but uh, especially considering who the roving bands of rapists eventually rape. Um, anyway, that's besides the point. Um, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Abraham does some more politicking. Um, he uh, makes some deals with some folks, says, um, I won't cross over this boundary mark if you don't cross over it um, in my direction, um, and we'll both be safe. Um, he, uh, he has the promised son, he has Isaac, and God tells him, go up on a mountain and sacrifice Isaac, and you're probably all familiar with this incident. Um, Kierkegaard wrote a, I think it was Kierkegaard. Yeah, Soren Kierkegaard wrote a really interesting, really dense 70 page book wrestling with um, how a good God could call 
a man, even if he had no intention of having that man follow through on this sacrifice, how a good God could call a man to sacrifice his own son, and how Isaac is supposed to deal with his father taking him up with the intent of sacrificing him. Um, and it's this really interesting incident, um, but we are not going to dive too deeply into it. Um, all that to say, during that incident, uh, this is the first time uh, God emphatically states that he will never ask for child sacrifice, which is a major departure from many of the other Canaanite gods. Um, and uh, also, um, another major thing Abraham does is he buys a plot of land in Canaan. So um, this begins a trend in theology um, called the already but not yet which is a very plain spoken way of saying that when God makes a promise, typically that promise has an already fulfillment and a not yet fulfillment, meaning that uh, God's promises are typically made to the person they're made to. So Abraham experienced the fulfillment of God's promise in his own lifetime. He had a descendant, he had uh, land in Canaan, and he was a blessing to his neighbors. But the ultimate fulfillment of the promise wouldn't come until generations upon generations later. Um, so, uh, that, and that theme, the, the idea that when God makes a promise, um, it points us to a further fulfillment of the promise. Uh, even when the promise is fulfilled in, in uh, current or, or immediately following times, there is a further fulfillment. Um, <clears throat> Next, we have Isaac, who is um, cut and paste Abraham again. Um, he marries his cousin, uh, Nahor's granddaughter. Um, he calls his wife his sister, just like Abraham did. And uh, he also is implicitly offering her up for sex. Uh, I, ironically, to the same person that uh, Abraham does the second time that he offers uh, Sarah up for sex um, in uh, Gerar. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Isaac digs a bunch of wells um, and fights over them, does some more politics, um, and he got tricked by a bit of wool and some good soup. Um, Isaac is really not that interesting a character to me, <laughs> um, at least the way he's written in the Bible. It really does sound like the authors are... Um, are, are the uh, anthologists who are compiling these traditions are trying to communicate that Isaac is essentially Abraham 2.0, <laughs> the way that he is described. Then we get to Jacob, and um, Jacob um, is a uh, anti-hero of many, many sorts. Um, his big notable feat is tricking his dad with a bit of wool and some good soup. Um, and then tricking his brother out of his birthright as the firstborn with a bowl of good soup and a lack of concern for his brother's well-being. Uh, when it says that uh, uh, Esau came in um, hungry, the, the word for hungry is, is emphatic. It, it means that he was starving. <laughs> so uh, his brother came into him starving and he's like, I'll feed you if you give me everything that belongs to you. Um, so Jacob is not a good dude. Um, he goes off, he marries two of his first cousins, um, and as, their, as well as their slave girls, and he has a bunch of kids, and he does more politics. And this time, the majority of the politics he's doing, and this is interesting, uh, the majority of the politics he's doing is with extended family, meaning that the family of Terah is increasing on the land of Canaan. Um, and even while Abraham is, um, his body is still warm, the uh, promise God makes to Abraham that his descendants would uh, inhabit the land is starting to come to fruition. Um, though not the chosen inhabitants yet. Um, the chosen family is still quite small at this time. Um, but uh, Jacob is a really interesting figure because... Um, unlike the other two, unlike Abraham and Isaac, Jacob is never secure about being the one that God promised. And um, Abraham relies a lot on that promise from God. Isaac never seems to question it. 
but Jacob is constantly fighting for somebody, anybody, please bless me, all the time. Um, and it gets to this point uh, where he is about to confront his brother, who he has basically stolen every every right of ownership of his father's um, inheritance from. And he... He goes to bed that night, completely afraid that his brother is going to kill him. Um, and while he's sleeping, a um, god comes down, or a representative god. The text isn't entirely clear. And he wrestles with him. Um, he wrestles with God, uh, physically, um, in the same way it's... it's um, in in it's a lived out version of the wrestling with God he's been doing his whole life. This um, please, please bless me um, that he's been doing his whole life. Um, and the sun's about to come up. And what you need to realize is that nobody sees God in his full glory and lives. And Jacob's not letting go. So God touches his hip, breaks it. Um, gives him serious permanent damage <laughs> um, and uh, asks him what he actually wants. Um, and Jacob says, I want a blessing. And again, after having blessed him multiple times already, God says, you're blessed. Stop worrying about it. I'm with you. Um, and he finally does go and he, he confronts Esau and it works out okay. Um, and from that moment on, it does seem to be uh, a different Jacob that we're dealing with. He does seem to be more secure in that blessing. Um, and uh, we don't see him wrestling with God anymore after this point. Um, and that Jacob becomes almost, um, not almost, he becomes a typology, um, a, uh, a typical example of what Israel would be. Um, Israel is a nation that would continually wrestle with God and God would strike them um, to get <laughs> to get them to stop, but he would keep blessing them anyway. Um, and uh, Jacob is not the only um, uh, negatively interesting person in his family. Um, his sons are not the best people. Um, he has to move a few times because um, one of the main reasons uh, he had to move once was Levi and Simeon kill all the men of the city after convincing those men to get circumcised because the city's prince raped their sister. Um, I have taught Genesis before and one of the comments, well, actually, no, this might have been Deuteronomy class that I got this comment, but um, <laughs> one of the comments I got was, this is some serious uh, Game of Thrones stuff. I was like, this is a little weirder than Game of Thrones, but yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Levi and Simeon kill an entire city of people uh, because the prince raped their sister, um, Dina. And uh, so Jacob's like, guys, now we have to move again because now all of the people of the land who had a contract with that city, a covenant with that city are going to try to kill us. Don't do that again. Um, and they were like, what were we supposed to do? Let them get away with it? And presumably Jacob fired back that genocide is, is a, a step too far. Um, anyway, moving on. So um, we already talked about that. We get to uh, Judah and Joseph. Um, so the last of the, uh, the big narratives of the Genesis um, anthology is the Joseph narrative. And within the Joseph narrative, we have this narrative about Judah. And uh, Judah's story of breaking covenant and having sex with what he thinks is a temple prostitute, and then generally just being a jerk, uh, is there to highlight a contrast with Joseph who holds covenants and refuses sex with a person in power over him. And, he re and how he remains outside of the cultic practices of Egypt. Um, Joseph is also a jerk, but he grows up a little by the end of the story. Um, 
something you might not notice um, because you are not a third century or fourth century BC um, Israelite or I excuse me, Judean. Um, Judah is the patriarch of Judea, which is the southern uh, kingdom, the the one that survives the exile. Um, Joseph, patriarch of Ephraim and Manasseh, who become idiomatic of all of the northern ten tribes, who are destroyed earlier, sent into exile earlier, and never come back. Joseph the paragon in the story is the patriarch of the the half of Israel that will go into exile er, earlier, fall away earlier, be more evil. And the patriarch of the good guys is a jerk who learns his lesson. Um, there are some other interesting tidbits in this story. Again, I'm trying to move quickly through this because I'm trying to get us caught up so that we can get into some of the rest of the Old Testament. Um, the Pentateuch is really dense. Um, and I realistically probably probably could have done all 12 weeks on just Genesis um, and still not, uh, not have enough time for all the material. Um, some other interesting notes. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Proof that Joseph is not a good person uh, at the start of the story. The the siblings that he goes and he tells um, he's going to rule over are the uh, siblings who are descended from the slave girls. So these siblings who in that culture already would have felt like second class citizens are now having their little brother who was um, born of one of uh, their father's um, proper wives, one of one of their um, father's uh, full full rights wives is now telling them oh not only are you going to be second class citizens but i'm going to make a point of ruling over you so joseph is kind of a jerk not kind he is a jerk um at the start of the story he is not a good person um and the event of him being sold into slavery it seems to be a humbling event that turns him around um, but even at the end of the story, he, he pulls some pretty jerkish things with his brothers. He seems to be trying to make sure that his uh, bio full bro full blooded brother uh, Benjamin is safe. But um, he he pulls some pretty pretty mean stuff on his brothers. Um, and that's how Genesis ends. Is um, we we have this final narrative where Joseph. Um, and his brothers are reconciled. Um, he's reconciled with Judah, who was sort of the ringleader in getting him sold off in the first place. Um, and uh, um, Jacob and his family moved down to Egypt. And the, the, um, the whole chosen family now lives in the re region of Goshen, uh, which is um, along the eastmost um, branch of the Nile Delta. And speaking of Egypt and the Nile Delta, we need to talk a little bit about Egyptian politics uh, as we move forward to really understand uh, some of what's going on in the rest of this narrative. So Egypt is a nation that is governed by a river. And what, by that I mean uh, the um, economic and political relationships in Egypt are very heavily dependent on where along the Nile they fall. Um, the Nile is divided up into um, the uh, Delta region, which is about um, from Cairo northward. And this is called Lower Egypt because it's at the bottom of the Nile, the outlet of the Nile, because the Nile flows north. Um, so Northern Egypt is Lower Egypt, and it is um, primarily the Delta of the Nile. Um, Upper Egypt is that portion between uh, just south of the Nile and the first cataract. And a cataract is a area of whitewater rapids that makes it difficult to travel the river. Um, Egypt is by far one of the oldest civilizations on the planet. Um, and it is one of the first civilizations to really achieve anything similar to an empire or a kingdom at least. Um, and it's because 
they are able to maintain this hyper-connectedness via this open trade route that is the Nile uh, north of its first whitewater rapid. Um, because north of that point, it is <clears throat> it is fairly calm, very, fairly placid. It has predictable flooding patterns. Um, it produces... Um, in, where the uh, floods in Mesopotamia um, come with extra salt that can sometimes damage the land, the floods in the Nile bring this really rich uh, black gook that uh, fertilizes the land. Um, and uh, so Egypt has a lot of things going for it. Um, and uh, beyond, let's see, do I have this? Yeah, so south of the first cataract, um, in the region of the, from the first cataract to the final, the sixth cataract, is an area called um, Kush. And uh, Kush is um, one of the frontier regions of Egypt. Um, they are under direct Egyptian control for the majority of the biblical period. Um, and uh, uh, just south of the sixth cataract, then is Punt, which is this uh, um, uh, African dynasty that we actually know very little about, but that appears to have been quite wealthy. Uh, it had a lot of exotic exports. Uh, Egypt's uh, main source of wealth was taking the wealth of Punt uh, that they received tra trading with Punt and um, trading it on northward with the Hittites and the Babylonians and then taking the luxuries from uh, the Hittites and the Babylonians and trading it back south with Punt. Um, so they would also uh, oftentimes recruit mercenaries from uh, Punt in the south, uh, as well as Cush, and then also Libya on the uh, west, um, outside of the Nile Valley. Um, and each of these regions, um, at some point or another during the heights of Egyptian politics, had heavy Egyptian influence, if not direct Egyptian control. Um, okay, you got a primer in Egyptian politics. Um, so where al along the timeline does Abraham fall? Um, he probably came around sometime uh, just before or during the second intermediate period, um, during the reign of the Hyksos or just before the reign of the Hyksos. Um, the Hyksos were a West Semitic speaking people with ties to Canaan um, and a little bit of ties to uh, um, uh, Aram and Syria um, <coughs> who moved into Lower Egypt as advisors. Um, so they were welcomed at first. Uh, they, they were treated as advisors. They brought with them the cuneiform of, uh, of the Akkadians. Uh, which made trade and uh, politics a lot easier. Um, they um, brought um, easier access to the, some of the wealth coming from those northern kingdoms. Um, and so they started off this colony in Avaris um, that uh, they would advise the pharaohs from and uh, act as sort of their diplomats. Um, and as they sort of gathered more and more wealth and prestige and power, and the pharaohs uh, declined in power and prestige in favor of the people, uh, the Hyksos just sort of kind of took over at some point. Um, and so um, the, uh, by the time that Abraham's family is kicking around, um, there are a, uh, there's a, um, a pharaoh in Egypt a, a king in Egypt who is a, essentially a Semitic king, a king who would have been much more closely related to Abraham and his family than to the actual Egyptians. Um, and that king would have been ruling from Avarice, uh, close to Pithom, which is what the, Lex, uh, the, excuse me, the um, Septuagint identifies with Goshen. Um, so again, this is on that uh, eastmost branch of the uh, Nile Delta. And this would have been about eight, between the 18th and 16th century BC that Abraham would have been there. Abraham um, would have gone down, and then Jacob as well. Jacob and Joseph's family would have been there, definitely during the Hyksos period. Um, and then, um, so the Hyksos, they only ever really ruled the Nile Delta in Lower Egypt. And at the very height of their power, they pushed slightly into Middle Egypt, but not very far. 
And since they didn't have access to that trade we talked about before, that really lucrative trade of all of the luxuries from Kush and Punt, um, they really couldn't sustain their economic advantage for long. Um, and Amos I uh, finally pushed out the ruling class and subjugated any other Asiatics, as they called them, that remained afterwards. And he established the 18th dynasty of Egypt. Um, uh, the 18th dynasty ushered in the New Kingdom period, which is the 18th and through the 20th dynasties. And it's um, it lasts only about 500 years, um, ending in the Bronze Age collapse, or the Great Collapse, as it's called. Um, and it is the last time Egypt will be the major power in the Fertile Crescent. Um, from this time on, they will um, have a couple of, of really impressive um, pharaohs go forward and um, really sack, um, sack foreign lands, but never conquer foreign lands again. Um, from this point on, after the New Kingdom, they will never become an empire again. They will be a kingdom along the Nile that sometimes strikes out outside of its borders. Um, and uh, the New Kingdom period was marked by hyperaggression against non-Egyptians, uh, very, very heavy amounts of xenophobia. Um, and especially they hated Levantine peoples, uh, peoples in Palestine, um, because of the embarrassment of the foreign rule by the Hyksos. Um, <clears throat> so when it says in, in Exodus, yeah, Exodus chapter 1, uh, verse 8, when it says, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, um, this is the event that it's talking about, is this time when the Hyksos are thrown out and all of a sudden you have you go from having these pharaohs who very much enjoy having the Hebrews around because they speak the same language or at least a very similar language. They write the same language and are very useful for their contacts in, um, in Ar Aram and uh, um, Acadia. Um, all of a sudden now you have an actual Egyptian ruling over Egypt and one that is incensed by the years of war um, that preceded this, one that's incensed by the embarrassment of Egypt being ruled by these uh, people that they considered barbarians, um, which is ironic considering the things that the uh, um, the Hyksos introduced to the Egyptians. But um, anyway, so uh, you, you end up with this uh, not just king, but series of kings, three dynasties of kings, the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties of kings, being incredibly prejudiced against any Asiatics, they called them. Um, and so uh, one of those kings, we're not entirely sure which, um, says in Exodus chapter 1, verse 10, come let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. And that's talking about the very real fear that the Israelites and those other, um, other Semitic speakers who are still left in Goshen will um, join up with the Semitic speakers that they kicked out, the ruling class that they kicked out, if that ruling class ever tried to conquer Egypt again. Um, so uh, this begins a series of incidents that the uh, Egyptians try to uh, use to force the Israelites um, into subjugation, uh, into being less of a threat um, should their enemies from the Levant attack again. Uh, so they start um, forcing them into labor which was not uncommon um, at this period of time. Forced labor also um, doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, at least at first, it wouldn't have necessarily mean, meant too much. But then they take it too far. Um, so I have these kind of in the wrong order here, but um, the labor increases beyond any ancient standards of moral acceptability. So there are actual rules in most, um, most ancient societies about how long you can work forced labor. Um, before the gods will get mad at you. Um, and so the pharaoh 
in this story is going beyond those acceptable standards. Um, and then he goes a step further than that even and attempts to commit genocide. Um, he tells the uh, Hebrew uh, midwives first to kill any uh, any men who are born, any young, any uh, infant boys who are born, um, women, and uh, this is still in a period of time where women are not seen to have their own agency or uh, nationality. Um, women are a tool to be used for politics at this period of time. Um, the Egyptians have some female rulers by this period, but still largely in ancient Near Eastern politics. Uh, part of the reason that they were more okay with the women being born, but not the men, is because um, women are not seen as being that much of a threat, um, at least in the Egyptians' eyes at this point. Um, so they command that all the male Israelites be killed, um, and they are going to commit genocide uh, via intermarriage, uh, forced intermarriage uh, with the women. Um, <laughs> obviously, the Israelite midwives did not take kindly to that and uh, subverted it every chance they could. Um, and uh, this figure comes out of this um, called Moses, um, the one who was drawn out. And the story says that he was found in the river by one of Pharaoh's daughters. Pharaoh, just so you know, this is probably not like Pharaoh's sweet little girl that he loves very, very much. This is probably one of Pharaoh's hundred daughters by his hundred concubines. Um, still, still in the royal court and still a member of the royal family. And uh, being raised by that uh, daughter means that Moses has access to the court. Um, he's probably being raised in the function of a diplomat of sorts, um, the way that other uh, lesser nobility are raised. Um, so um, he would have been more akin to the Ill illegitimate and non-inheriting children of Pharaoh's family than an actual prince, um, like some, some movies have portrayed him. Um, he would not have been considered brothers with the uh, the heir apparent by any means. Um, things he would know, though, having been raised in the royal household, is he would know how to read and write. Um, at, and at this time, reading and writing still would have been in Akkadian cuneiform, uh, which was the administrative and diplomatic language, which means that then when he went and learned Hebrew from his midwife mother, um, his mother, who is his wet nurse, his bio mother, um, he would also be able to read and write Hebrew because Hebrew at the time was not the Hebrew that uh, we received in the received tradition. The Hebrew of that time would have also been written in Akkadian cuneiform. Um, and he also would have likely had some formal military uh, leadership training, uh, training in how to ration goods, training in how to use basic battle tactics, training in the known geography of the world, training in logistics. Um, and all of these things um, from the ability to read and write, which is not common at this period of time for anyone but diplomats um, and scribes, and the abilities of uh, basic nobility, which involve primarily military leadership training, um, all, all would serve him well when he becomes the leader of Israel. Um, one thing you need to remember when you read this story is that Egyptians and Semitic peoples don't look that much alike. Um, Moses would not have passed for a member of the royal family even a little bit. And the differences would have been glaringly obvious to him and everyone around him from a very young age. So he would have likely had more had he likely would have identified more with his wet nurse, who was his bio mom from a very young age because she actually looked like him and he actually and he likely learned the Hebrew language and customs from her uh, while he was growing up and definitely figured out at some point that he was not actually Pharaoh's daughter's um, son, likely figured out at some point that he was a Hebrew. Um, which explains why when you get to him seeing the uh, Hebrew being abused in the field by an uh, Egyptian, he identifies with the Hebrew. Um, 
And that uh, leads us to the next point. He has quite a temper, and his temper gets him into trouble. So he goes to live among some of the descendants of Abraham's concubine, Keturah. Um, if you go back to that um, slide, uh, the first slide, rather, um, you'll see that little section. Um, the Midianites are other descendants of Abraham by a different wife. And so he, he goes and lives with the Midianites, and he marries Zipporah, the daughter of Jethro. And Jethro is a priest um, who apparently, at least to the knowledge that he still has of who that God is, he apparently still serves the God of Abraham. Uh, there are probably, um, I'm not probably, there, there almost certainly are some things that he is doing wrong in that worship because he has not been the recipient of the Mosaic Law. But he is doing his best, it appears, to worship the God of his father Abraham. Um, and so he is a, uh, um, a recurring figure a couple of times uh, in, uh, in Moses' story, and he will talk to Moses about uh, his relationship with God um, on a couple of times. Um, so Moses gets to this point uh, where he's interacting with this burning bush while he's serving his uh, father-in-law Jethro, uh, serving his flock. Moses finds this burning bush that's growing healthier rather than burning up, and he decides to go and talk to it. Um, and so the bush uh, is a uh, manifestation of God's glory, and <clears throat> God speaks through the bush and tells Moses that God's chosen him to go talk to Pharaoh. And uh, so Moses gets a little sassy with God, he goes, who do you think I am? I can't go talk to Pharaoh. I can't even talk to my own people. I have lead for a tongue. Um, and God's like, who do you think I am? <laughs> who, who makes somebody mute or gives them the ability to speak? Who do you think you're talking to? Um, and so uh, eventually uh, God says, fine, go ahead, take your brother with you. But you are going. I am sending you. You're going. <laughs> this is not a conversation. This is not an option. You're going. Uh, so Moses reluctantly goes. Um, within that little narrative, there is this bit where Moses asks, um, who am I supposed to say I'm coming from? Like, if, if I come and talk to these people and say I'm talking on behalf of God, they're going to ask me which God, uh, because they are now used to Egyptian polytheism. Um, they're going to want to know, is it Set? Is it Osiris? What God is calling us that uh, has abandoned these Egyptians? Who do I say you are? Um, so God gives him the sacred name. Um, and he says, I'm not the God of the Egyptians. I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and the sacred name is um, yod heh vav -Hav, um, which is... Uh, transliterated, which means put into English letters, um, Y-H-W-H. Um, it has no direct translation, um, and it's uh, it has no appropriate vowel pointing. Um, it is not supposed to be said out loud in most circumstances. Um, the exception is uh, if you are participating in the most carefully orchestrated, reverent, and sacred contexts, then it is appropriate to use the divine name. Um, the, in fact, it, it was used so sparingly that the knowledge of how to pronounce it has been utterly lost, and all we are left with are educated guesses about what the vowel pointings might have been. Uh, we are also left, however, with the absolute certainty that it was not pronounced Jehovah, um, because Jehovah is a mispronunciation that comes from English speakers not talking to Jews. Um, and <laughs> there's a lot of Bible translation issues that come from English speakers not talking to Jews, by the way. Um, so, um, in the sacred texts, um, the Masoretes, um, Masoretes, who were responsible for preserving the final form of the text uh, in its original Hebrew, um, they added the vowel pointings. So in the sacred text, there are no vowels because Hebrew is a vowel-less language. 
Later, later Hebrew speakers, later Israelites, added vowel pointings to make the text more readable. Um, and the vowel pointings are not considered sacred. The consonants are considered sacred. The vowels are not. Um, so in order to facilitate the reading of the scripture, uh, the Masoretes, um, being having Hebrew as a second language themselves and being able to speak it relatively fluently, went through and made educated guesses about which consonants uh, were, uh, or excuse me, which words were represented by which consonants because there are multiple words represented by the same three consonants. Um, most words in Hebrew have a core of three consonants uh, with some suffixes and some prefixes attached. Um, but uh, so the Masoretes produced this um, document and the problem they ran into was that when these texts were read out loud in the synagogue, it was considered inappropriate to try to pronounce the holy name, the, the uh, divine name of God. So what they did was they inserted the vowel pointings for Adonai, Lord, into the divine name. And when you try to pronounce Adonai, uh, the vowel pointings for Adonai with the consonants for the divine name, it comes out sounding like Jehovah. And that's where we get Jehovah from. Um, it is a result of people not talking to Jews. Um, so anyway, some history lesson for you. Um, the divine name is, however, uh, so this whole um, I am, where uh, God has this discussion with Abraham and he says, I am. Um, it's because the divine name is a lost tense of the Hebrew copula. Uh, copula is a being verb, so in English it's be, being, is, um, was, are, those, those verbs that uh, communicate um, action, um, existence, um, yeah, I'm not a linguist, but yeah, that, that, that subsection of, of verbs so the divine name is essentially saying God is the one who actually is. Um, that we, again, the, the actual tense of the uh, verb is lost that gets used in the divine name. So we're not exactly sure what the, the um, full meaning is, but uh, the sense of it seems to be that when God says, this is the name you will know me by, is he's saying, you will know me by the, the mere fact that I am the only real one. Um, I am the only one who actually is. Um, <clears throat> so Moses goes with this new information. God gives him a few parlor tricks uh, to uh, impress the Hebrews to prove that he actually came from God. Um, and... Uh, so uh, he does that. The, he gets the Hebrews okay to go to Pharaoh, and he has this first confrontation with Pharaoh, and he, he only asks for three days in the wilderness to worship our God. Uh, he doesn't say, I want to go take all of the Israelites away from Egypt forever um, to go settle in the promised land in Canaan, uh, like our God promised us. He says, let us go for three days to worship God in the desert. Um, and Pharaoh says he doesn't know your God, um, meaning uh, the implication of that is that the Hebrew God is not recognized in, in Pharaoh's pantheon of gods. He is not recognized by uh, Pharaoh or Egypt as a real God. So Pharaoh does not believe that this God has any actual power here in the land of Egypt. And something you need to realize about the ancient mind is that uh, they believed that their gods had power, and they believed in a uh, cosmic reality about their gods. But they also uh, had doubts that their gods had power outside of the territory that they exist in. So if a god is only worshipped in this territory, it is believed that that is because that is the only territory that god has power over. Um, so Pharaoh believed that uh, apparently believed that if this god did exist, he was a god of a foreign power and had no power here in Egypt. Um, and so he's like, come at me, bro. <laughs> Essentially, 
Uh, if, if you really think your God has power here in Egypt over the gods that I actually pay sacrifices to, then uh, come at me. Um, so he also gets offended by their request. And he, as a result, increases the labor of the Israelites. He takes away the straw that they can use to build bricks. Um, so they now, uh, straw is used in brick making to make the bricks more stable uh, so that when you actually build out of them, they're less likely to shatter and break uh, in the heat. Um, they're less likely to shatter and break in the heat when they're actually kilned. Um, and they're a fill. That means you have uh, less mud quarrying to do. Um, so he takes away the straw allotment for the Israelites so that they no longer have um, this very vital resource for brick making. But he says, you still have to make just as many bricks. And I want this, these storage uh, depots built faster. Um, at the time, they were being commanded to build storage depots, presumably for uh, grains and military goods, um, in preparation for another excursion into the Levant um, to deal righteous justice against their one-time conquerors again. Um, so uh, Moses gets uh, a pretty nasty response from the Israelites. They're, uh, they're like, what have you done? We were way better off before you got involved. So Moses in turn gets mad at God. So God says, just hear me out. Try it again. But this time, have Aaron go with you and throw a stick on the ground. <laughs> so that's God's reassurance is, you know, I know you're mad, man, but uh, I want you to try it again. And this time I want you to throw a stick on the ground or actually have your brother throw a stick on the ground. Uh, so Moses does this because, you know, what the heck? Uh, they have this second confrontation and Aaron throws his stick on the ground and that stick turns into a snake. Um, and Snakes are a religious um, symbol in Egypt, a uh, symbol of fertility, of um, power, um, of magic in Egypt. And so having control over serpents is a sign that you have some serious power um, in Egyptian cultists. Um, so uh, Aaron does this. He throws the staff on the ground. It becomes a stick. Uh, <laughs> a snake. He throws the stick on the ground. It becomes a snake. Uh, Pharaoh has his priests throw their sticks on the ground. They also become snakes. Uh, but Aaron's serpent eats their serpents. Um, his staff eats their staffs. Um, and so Pharaoh gets mad and he refuses to let them go. And um, so God as uh, Moses goes back to God and is like, it didn't work again. And so God's like, go back again. And this time, hit the Nile with that stick. Uh, presumably the stick is no longer a snake at this point and God, that God wants uh, Aaron to hit the, or Moses to hit the Nile with it. Um, so they have the third confrontation and they hit the water with the stick and the water turns to blood. Um, the water of the Nile turns to blood. And remember, Egypt's whole identity, who they are as a nation is defined by this river. The whole power of their existence is defined by this river. The whole river turns to blood. And this means that people are gonna starve. This means people are going to go thirsty. The economy is on the verge of collapsing. Um, but Pharaoh, he has his magicians do something similar in a little bowl. So he's convinced that Moses has no real power, or he allows himself to be convinced that Moses has no real power that his magicians don't have. Um, and so he, he just goes off and, and sulks for a bit, convincing himself that widespread starvation and thirst and uh, the collapsing economy are uh, entirely um, not a problem. <laughs> uh, so God tells Moses, uh, okay, try again, go back, and this time just talk to him and see what happens. Uh, so on the fourth confrontation, oh, excuse me. Yeah, fourth confrontation. It's wrong on my slides, but it'll be right on yours because I'm fixing it now. Um, there are frogs, frogs everywhere. There's a plague of frogs. Moses goes back. He talks to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, no deal. Um, and so... Frogs come streaming out of rivers and channels and the earth. 
and plague the whole city. They get into everything. They start eating everything, um, defiling everything. Uh, Pharaoh's magicians duplicate this as well, um, but considering there were already frogs everywhere, it doesn't seem that Pharaoh is happy with the fact that his magicians just made more. Uh, so he asks Moses that if the Lord would remove the plague of frogs, um, if Moses can get the Lord to remove the plague of frogs, then he'll let the Israelites go to and worship God in the desert for a few days. Um, so Moses prays to the Lord, the frogs die off, and uh, uh, the Egyptians make these big piles of dead frogs, and um, they stink, and they're decaying, and they're gross, and they defile the land, and uh, this is apparently what Pharaoh wanted, because um, he reneges on his promise. Um, and so God sends Moses back another time. And he says, this time you're going to hit the dirt with the stick. Um, so Moses goes back for a fifth confrontation. And he hits the dirt with a stick, or Aaron hits the dirt with a stick. And the dirt flies up into the air and becomes gnats. And uh, all of the dust of the earth in Egypt, the Bible says, becomes gnats. The munitions are completely out of their, de their depth on this one. And they tell Pharaoh that the only one that only one of the gods could really do this the magicians are not able to the priests are not able to only the one of the gods they say can do this so pharaoh tells the magicians to shut up and he sulks off and says no again um so god says go back and this next time it's going to be flies and so moses goes back and um there's a plague of flies and <laughs> things are getting worse um and just so you know, these, even, uh, I, I mentioned with the Nile, um, what's going on here is a power encounter. We've talked a couple of times, I think, in Sunday school about power encounters, um, and maybe in church. Um, a good example of this, and I know I've used this before for those of you who uh, attend my Sunday school class, um, not long ago, um, there was a missionary doing missions in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in a remote tribe um, that uh, has remained relatively isolated. And this tribe worshipped a type of animism, which is a uh, belief that all, all rocks and trees and everything have spirits. And the particular spirit that their shaman worshipped was the spirit of this big tree, this big ancient tree that had been sitting in the village forever. And when the missionary came and started preaching the word of Jesus, uh, the shaman came up to him and said, I'm going to pray to my spirit tonight, and he is going to come in, in your sleep, and he's going to kill you, um, the, the tree spirit. Uh, so obviously the missionary goes to bed that night a little afraid that the shaman's going to come and finish him off himself. So he prays to God that night. And that night, a thunderstorm rolls in, and a bolt of lightning strikes the tree and burns it to the ground. And that is what's called a power encounter. Um, and it happens a lot in the Bibles, in, in, the, in the books of the Bible. Uh, when God is faced with a, uh, a person who believes in another God, uh, a figure who believes in the strength of other gods, he will use the power of that God against that person to prove that God is mightier than their gods. Um, and that's sort of the subtext of all of the plagues is, uh, there's an Egyptian god who's uh, the uh, the god of the Nile. There's an Egyptian god who's the god of uh, uh, of flies and gnats and locusts and uh, death and decay and frogs and um, uh, so God is having this this power encounter with the gods of Egypt and saying, "I'm mightier than they are." Um, and so we have the sixth confrontation and. You know, gnats are small, flies are big, and flies are a lot more destructive than gnats are. Gnats will maybe eat uh, um, a little bit, spoil some fruit, but flies will um, get into all of all of the edible produce around and destroy it. Um, and so God makes flies cover only Egypt, uh, only the inhabitants of Egypt. Um, the Semitic region of Goshen is completely spared. From this plague 
So Pharaoh tries to make a deal this time, and he says to Moses, you guys can worship here. You're not allowed to go in the desert. You can worship here if you really need to worship your God. Just be done with this plague business. And so Moses says, we're going to sacrifice animals that are sacred to your religion. You don't want us doing that here. It would be bad for you politically. Let us go out three days journey into the desert and we will sacrifice there. And Pharaoh gets antsy and he says, no, uh, just go out a little bit and first make the flies go away. Um, so Moses says, fine, uh, we'll go out a little bit to worship God. And Moses prays to God and, um, and uh, God removes the plague of the flies. But Pharaoh dub double crosses him. Um, and again, just like he did last time, says, no, I'm not letting you go. Um, so God tells Moses again to go back, and this time it's going to start getting really bad. Um, so the, uh, we're in the seventh confrontation now. And whole masses of Egyptian livestock get sick and die in a matter of days. Uh, the livestock of the Israelites in Goshen are completely fine. Not a single one of their livestock died during the plague that killed off the majority of the Egyptian livestock. Um, but Pharaoh's really dug his heels in at this point, and it's becoming more and more politically da disastrous for him to uh, let the Israelites go because he's dug his heels in so much. So he hardens his heart again and says no. Uh, and so God says to Moses, go back and throw some soot in the air this time. Uh, so Moses goes back, he throws some soot in the air, and a cloud of soot descends on Egypt, um, giving all of them bo painful boils. Everyone outside of the region of Goshen, where the Israelites and the other Semitic peoples are. Um, the magicians are in such misery from the boils that they don't even want to see Moses, much less try to duplicate what he did. So Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh just kind of sulks off again and gets mad again and hardens his heart again. So God tells Moses, go back and warn them about this next one because a storm's coming. And we're told in the scriptures that hail like this has never hit Egypt before. Uh, we've talked before also sometimes in my class about uh, supernatural storms and how it's one thing for it to rain. It is another thing for, for the heavens to open up and for death and chaos to rain down. Um, so uh, we had that image uh, a couple of lectures ago uh, where you guys saw the, uh, the firmament uh, and the windows in the firmament. So the firmament is just this firm thing that holds back the cosmic ocean. Um, and when, the co when it rains normally, that rain comes from within the atmosphere on the inside of the firmament. When it rains chaotically, it means that the windows to that chaos are open and chaos is raining down. Um, the Egyptians believed that rain was a curse. They didn't get storms in Egypt. Storms were for those other places. They didn't need storms in Egypt to fertilize their ground. They had the Nile. A storm comes, and it's the worst storm they've ever seen in the whole history of Egypt. It is Storms are considered a curse already in Egypt. It means that the gods are mad with you. But this storm is worse than any storm they have in their history books. Moses warns the Egyptians before it happens that it's going to be really bad, that the hailstorm is coming, and that they should move their flocks and their servants inside. Some listen, some don't. The ones that listen, their, their flocks and their servants survive. The ones that don't, the hail kills everyone and everything in the field. And it shatters the uh, orchards, the trees in the orchards, and the cedar groves uh, of Egypt. This hailstorm ruined the economy of Egypt. <laughs> and we're told that the storm, um, the storm destroys all of the early grains as well. Um, so Moses comes begging Moses to get the storm to stop. Um, this 
is by far the most um, the most terrifying thing yet that Moses has done uh, for any ancient person, but particularly an Egyptian. Um, and he's also worried because it's ruined all of their agriculture, um, and he wants it to stop before the late grains come in, or else the whole nation is going to starve. Um, so Moses prays, and the storm stops, and Pharaoh again reneges on his promise uh, once the storm is over. So God says, go back and give Pharaoh a choice. Tenth conversation. Um, the, the tenth confrontation. Let us go or lose what's left to a plague of locusts. Moses gives Pharaoh this choice, and Pharaoh asks, who exactly do you intend to take on this religious ex excursion? And Moses says, all of our people have to go, and everything they own has to go with them. So Pharaoh tries to deal with him again, and he says, you're up to something. Leave the women and the children here, and the men can go and worship. Moses says, fine, locusts it is. And so the locusts come, they eat the late grains, they eat the saplings um, that had been planted to replace the orchards and the groves, and they infest every house and stable and granary. Um, any fruit that was left on a tree um, before, uh, by, by the hailstorm, any tree that was left intact by a hailstorm, the leaves, everything green in the country gets eaten by the locusts. It's all gone. Um, and not just in the fields, every, everything in the households, everything in the stables, everything in the granaries, everything's gone. The food is gone. So Pharaoh begs forgiveness, and Moses prays, and God removes the locusts, and again, Pharaoh reneges on his promise. So God says, go back and make it dark. Um, and this darkness is not normal darkness. Um, the word is the same word used of the state of creation before God makes light. Um, this is an uncreation event, this darkness. It is the kind of darkness that only supernatural light can penetrate. So Pharaoh says, th this is, again, so in our minds, the hailstorm and the boils are probably worse than, but this is an uncreation event. This is creation um, unmaking itself in the very presence of Pharaoh. And at this time, uh, solar worship was becoming more and more popular. Um, so one of the most powerful gods in the Egyptian pantheon is the god of the sun. And um, so now God's not only challenged the god of the Nile, he's not only challenged the gods of healing and the gods of harvest, he's now challenged the god of the sun and shown that he is greater. So Pharaoh says, you can go, but leave your livestock here. And Moses says, what are we supposed to sacrifice if we don't take our livestock? And Pharaoh gets mad at that and says, fine, stay here then. And if I ever see you again, I'll kill you. So Moses says, you're right. We're never going to see each other again. And Moses never has a direct confrontation with Pharaoh again. Um, Next, the next thing to happen is the Passover. Uh, this is one of the, if you are a parent, <laughs> this is one of the most heart-wrenching scenes in the Bible to have to picture. Um, it's the first feast commanded by God. Um, it involves the uh, unleavened bread because that's what the Hebrews had to make uh, in preparation for fleeing Egypt. Um, it's uh, the... Uh, Hebrews, in preparation for it, were told to go to their neighbors and um, request um, offerings for their God, uh, which their neighbors were all too willing to give, considering all the plagues that had just happened. Um, and they were to slaughter a, um, a lamb and put its blood on their doorposts as a sacrifice to protect their firstborn, uh, literally redeeming, paying the price for their firstborn with the blood of the lamb. Um, and anyone who had that blood, anyone who had paid that price, um, and had that blood on their doorpost, their firstborn was protected. And anyone who did not, um, 
they lost all of their firstborn in their house. Every every firstborn male of their house, human, animal, any firstborn male. And so Pharaoh sends to Moses. He doesn't invite Moses into his presence again. He sends a message to Moses telling him to get out, to take everyone and everything and get out and to never come back. And so we're told in Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, that a mixed multitude goes up with them, uh, probably including the other groups of enslaved West Semitic speaking people left over from the Hyksos uh, who had reigned in Goshen. Um, and uh, so this mixed multitude goes out and uh, one of the common questions at this point is how many men? Uh, it says, uh, most translations probably say 600,000. Um, the, uh, the problem is that um, the use, the conventions by which large numbers were communicated in Hebrew um, and large groups were counted, those conventions changed a few times in the short history of Israel. Um, and the use of the Hebrew language. So it's not exactly clear whether it was six regiments of a thousand, whether it was 600,000, whether it was um, six tribes of a thousand, whether it was 600 tribes, whether it was 600 regiments. Uh, it, it, it's just not clear. Um, a lot of people are like, you're not, you're not being literal enough with your translation. The problem is that 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 being literal with the translation requires knowing how the numbers worked and we don't so um yeah later later writers in the bible do make the assumption that it is a very large group um presumably uh 600,000 um but again, um, at later traditions, I should say, I don't know necessarily that it comes up again in the Bible. Later traditions uh, do assume, early traditions do assume that uh, the number was 600,000. Um, but again, we're just, we are removed, far enough removed from the time that this story was written that it's not clear um, how many people went up. Um, so, uh, these people go, and God leads them. Uh, the The most direct route would have been up along the coast where the uh, Philistines live, but instead God leads them over towards the ocean. Um, and so Pharaoh hears that the Hebrews have made a wrong turn and are heading towards the sea instead of the land bridge between the uh, continent of Egypt and the um, continent of Asia. And so he he decides that he's going to chase after them. And when the Hebrews see him coming, they get sassy with Moses and um, say uh, something along the lines of, weren't there enough graves in Egypt that decided that we needed to die out here for us to be buried? Um, and so Moses uh, gets angry with God again. And, um, God tells Moses, don't worry, I got this. Hold up your staff. Um, and when Moses does this, God parts the waters to make way for life again. And that's a theme. We, remember, you, we've talked about this uh, the last couple of lectures. God parts the waters to make way for life. He parts the waters that separate us from life and keep us in death. Um, so God parts the waters for the Israelites. And again, this is, you know, whether it was the Reed Sea or the Red Sea isn't important. What matters is this is a water body that other gods would not have been able to part. God parts it. God makes way for life in the face of death. And so the Israelites cross safely and the whole Egyptian army is defeated without the Hebrews drawing a single sword. And that's an important note, because Moses had them marching in military order, uh, the, the text says. Moses was expecting a fight. God protected them. Uh, Moses was relying, relying on his military training. 
Moses was thinking, I'm going to have to keep these people going. And God tells Moses not to raise your sword, not to get ready for a fight. Raise your staff and I'll protect you. So he raises his staff. The water splits. The people get through safe and the Egyptians drown. And the song Moses sings on the other side calls our attention back to creation imagery. Um, the, the imagery of God's spirit, God's breath hovering over the waters, parting them to make way for life, and to the flood blotting out the evils of the Pharaoh, just like it blotted out the evils of the uh, pre-flood, the antediluvian race of, of Adam. Um, this is where we're stopping. Uh, the Israelites... In the Exodus, God is mirroring the blessings he has made to Adam, to Noah, and to Abraham in his blessings to the Israelites, um, making absolutely clear that this is the people he's chosen. Um, we are going to get into uh, some more politics, because <laughs> we have to, in the coming lecture. Um, if you guys have questions about how these things worked out, I can't promise I have answers um, because again, we are still dealing with truly ancient documents. Um, and even the people who compiled the, the received tradition um, were dealing with ancient documents and having to figure out uh, how they fit together. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of questions and not all of them have answers this side of heaven. Um, I'm sorry, that's the truth. Um, and if you study the Old Testament, you just sort of get used to that kind of ambiguity um, and not having clear answers all the time. Um, but uh, the main point, the main point I want to make with this um, is that that theme is continuing on here. Uh, got those, those major themes that the Hebrew God is displaying power that the other gods are not capable of. Um, you know, we talked in the creation narrative, the Hebrew God, where the other gods in the other creation narratives barely defeat chaos uh, by trickery and deceit and um, by throwing everything they have at it. The Hebrew God just tells it to move and it moves. Um, the Hebrew God does things that the other gods couldn't dream of. Um, and the Hebrew God parts the waters of death and chaos to make way for life. Um, so with that, I will see you all in a couple of weeks. Uh, and take care.